ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Javier Bonilla. My name is Joshua Liu. We are from Prom Protection and Protection Division. And allow me uh, to warmly welcome and thank you for participating in this uh, site event promoting home gardening practices for agrodiversity and nutrition. And before we start, please uh, scan the QR code that is on the screen and you can also go to slido.com and join our uh, Q&A discussion. Uh, the, co the code is GARDEN. Thank you, Javier. You can also see the, uh, the QR code on the screen so you can scan it or you can enter the website and with the hashtag GARDEN. So we'll have a lot of questions, Q and A's, and you can feel free to post your questions through Slido. So first of all, let's have a quick quiz through the Slido. Please open it. We have three quite simple questions. So during you are having the quiz with the Slido, we'll start by receiving the opening remarks from the deputy director from Plum Production and Protection Division. And then we'll have two presentations with some demonstrations. The first one will be Together for Biodiversity, the Seed Bank and Gardening Practices by Chakadili Disemi. And the second one, Small Space, Big Harvest, Urban Gardening in Ports by Skula de Verde. And after the trigger from those presentations, we will have a discussion in the Q&A session. During the, during the presentation, please feel free to post your questions on the slider. We will answer it. And we will also, for some questions, we will answer during the Q&A session. Thank you. OK, so before we receive our presentations, allow me to recognize the presence of our deputy director, Mr. Chikulu Emba. Mr. Chikelu Emba has been working in the organization for 13 years, leading the seeds and plant genetic resources team of our division. Our deputy director, it's an honor to have you here, and thank you so much. And now I would like to keenly invite you to officially open this site event. Mr. Deputy Director, the floor is yours. Thank you so very much. Um... I have to confess uh, to you all that uh, I approach this uh, task with some level of uh, trepidation. Uh, that is because I have uh, I have uh, three children uh, who are young adults, uh, like some of you, and uh, they basically don't listen to me anymore. I think. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, everything I say to them, they take with a pinch of salt, with some level of uh, suspicion that uh, I may not mean, mean well for them. And um, so um, coming into a room uh, uh, filled with uh, young people like you, so you can imagine that uh, that uh, sense of uh, concern is even multiplied the more. And um, uh, distinguished guests and participants, their colleagues, if you, the young people, uh, don't trust us, uh, you have every right not to, to trust us because I think my generation and the generations that came before me, we are doing everything that we can to let you down. Uh, but um, uh, <laughs> I tell you that uh, in FAO, uh, it is uh, a bit uh, different. In FAO, we think uh, differently. And uh, let me just uh, start, and uh, I hope you recognize that I speak from the heart. So let me start by uh, reminding us that uh, in spite of the, the fanfare, the, the, the carnival, carnival type of uh, environment that we have inside this room and which we have been experiencing since the beginning of the week, 
uh, we actually have serious problems. We actually have serious problems as a, as a civilization that in spite of all the advancements that we have made, as we speak, as we gather here, one out of every 10 persons will go to bed hungry tonight. And that is globally. Going nearer home to Sub-Saharan Africa, where I come from, is actually one out of every five persons who abide the unconscionable scourge of hunger and malnutrition in the 21st century. And we made this commitment that uh, we will abolish hunger and malnutrition in all its forms and wherever they are called by 2030. We see this harvest. How many more harvests do we have before 2030? Just about seven, about seven harvests. Yet, my dear good friends, hunger and malnutrition has been getting worse. It has been getting worse for maybe five, six, seven years now. And uh, I don't want to dampen your morale by reeling out these dire statistics. It's just for us to underscore uh, how important it is for us to take whatever vocation that we have in this regard quite seriously. As we do in FAO, the, the director general, the senior leadership, and all of us, we uh, don't think that it should be all doom and gloom. We can actually, with the knowledge, with the skills, with everything that is available to us, we can abolish hunger and malnutrition in the next seven years. However, however, and there is a caveat here, things will have to be done differently. As the director general says, business as usual is not an option. And that is what the FAO strategic framework seeks to do, to transform agri-food systems to become more efficient, inclusive, sustainable, leaving no one behind, using these uh, four aspirational betas, better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life. And we, in the Plant Production and Protection Division, considering that 80% of all food are plant-based, we recognize that we will play the most critical role for the better production, which is just about producing more with less. So our mantra in the division is optimization and minimization. Optimize all the good things about sustainable crop production, enhanced productivity, nutritional food, while minimizing all the negative aspects, the deleterious environmental footprints of our production systems. And everyone has a role to play, including you, the youth, and that is why what we are doing today is critically important, that uh, we demonstrate that even if we are all living in urban settings, in peri-urban settings, we all can contribute to producing significantly more nutritious food to feed everyone. And uh, is, uh, that is why I find this event gratifying. I thank all the organizers. I realize we have um, uh, speakers from Chekatori, the, the Semi, and Scuola de, de Verde. And uh, I think you have probably heard enough uh, from uh, the, one of the, the people creating problems on planet Earth. And, uh, you know, I will see the stage uh, seriously and sit back and uh, listen to the youth take center stage and advise us as to how we all could, just by having our little gardens, contribute to this quest, generational 
quest of being that generation that finally abolishes hunger and malnutrition. And I thank you all so, so very much. Thank you, Deputy Director. Thank you for sharing your experience and also the facts and also highlighting the importance of the role of our diversity and individual meaningful actions in addressing agro-food system challenges. And now we have the answers from the quiz. We can see from the screen, like we're happy to see most of the participants are from Rome. So in the German room, we're happy to see you here. And then the next question, the next answer is, we can see, in fact, more than 50% of our participants who have your own home gardens. And also there are around 44% of participants. You don't have it. Today is a great opportunity for you to start your home gardens. And the last, we are surprisingly to see that the tomatoes is your favorite. So perhaps you can see, you can find some tomatoes here. If you're not, like we'll see in the presentations. So let's welcome our first speaker from Ciacadali di Semi. Ciacadali di Semi is an Italian nonprofit association. They are committed to the rescue and preservation of rare varieties from Italy and the world. For a few years now, they have been promoting various projects that involve professional farmers and children in both commercial and self-production activities. Through those activities, they prompt the public to discover the importance of biodiversity and sustainability in today's agricultural world. Now, dear Pietro and Sylvia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Sylvia. I'm a translator, and I work with Shercatori de Semi. Uh, what we do, as Yashin says, is we find, uh, safe, reproduce, and distribute heirloom varieties that are in risk of this disappearance or in risk of genetic erosion. First, uh, I want to bring us all into context. Uh, we, as I'm pretty sure you all know, biodiversity is all kinds of life we find in an area. So animals, vegetables, microorganisms, and even fungi keep build and keep the ecosystem together. And they are also the ones that maintain everything we need to survive, food, medicine, and water. In this case, we're gonna focus on a subcategory of biodiversity, which is agrobiodiversity. That's what we do. This is the result from natural process of the earth, but also from uh, decisions uh, and ingenuous ingenu de developments of farmers, herders, and fishers over millennia. Our association was founded in 2015, and it is actually born out of love of freedom because our president was <laughs> has always been an avid traveler, and the one common denominator he found in every places he visited was the social injustice and the unfair distribution of land, which leads to monoculture problems. And you will be wondering why, because whoever has the land decides what to cultivate. So there are complete islands where only one variety of rice is grown, which leads also to this problem we are having with genetic erosion. So, and we leads also to extreme poverty and lack of food independence. Uh, this happens because of governmental decisions and they're partnering with uh, big companies that are the ones that decide what people should grow and what products you should give your plants in order to have them thrive. Uh, our goals are to achieve, help people achieve agricultural freedom, the production of distrib and distribution of reproducible heirloom seeds, uh, the cultivation adapted to soil and changing weather conditions as the extreme ones we are living now. And we keep doing research on local varieties at risk of genetic erosion. And I don't mean local Italian only, but local to a place. We have many Asian varieties, European and South American too. 
and the divulgation of techniques and practices to reproduce our own seeds that we do through free guides posted on our website that people can download and use for free. How do we do it? We have open uh, days when people can come to the farm and ask for free seedlings and seeds. And that is our farm. And that's our greenhouse. Uh, we also have a school projects when during a window of the year, teachers write to us asking for this project and we send them for free. Um, first of all, the instructions on how they should conduct the activity, uh, the description of the varieties we send, the seeds, and we usually choose seeds that are beautiful or interesting for children to look at. So that you see there, it's called a uh, gem glass corn, which is also actually called colorful and is far for children. We send them a mold, a wooden mold that they can use to create their own paper vases, which brings them also closer to uh, recycling. And a small pipette, plastic one, to water their, their seeds. So they feel like uh, they're part of a scientific project and it makes them feel like really interested and we bring them close to agriculture, which our younger generations are maybe forgetting about. We also do lots of research. This is actually an isolated garden. We are working on dry farming. And whenever we finish uh, this research, we will post the results for free. But the idea is that we get um, varieties that are naturally resistant to extreme heat and to uh, low watering conditions. And this is actually one of our Mexican garden. There you see tomatillos and chili peppers. These varieties are grown isolated for three years in order to guarantee uh, uh, alien influences and to ascertain their standards. So this is a way to remind farmers that there is a, a market for other varieties rather than the usual they are cultivating. Because for example, in cuisine, chefs or cooks are on a high demand for new things with which they can make the recipes of their homes and this is our war of migrants, so everybody wants to taste a little bit of home when they are not there. Uh, why is it important to cultivate at home? And I'm not telling that with a small garden, you're gonna be totally food independent, but it's a start. At least if you want a salad, you don't have to go all the way to the supermarket every day. So these are some facts, but the main thing is that as farmers are presented with new, more neutral varieties or more productive, they are ab abandoning other ones. And that's why the genetic pool is getting smaller and smaller. And we are losing plants and not, not only uh, plants, also uh, cattle, for example, about three or six breeds, I don't know, have been lost in recent times. Uh, so what can you cultivate at home? All sorts of uh, vegetables, tomatoes, eggplants, lettuces, uh, herbal plants, cucumbers, and with some experience, even melons. You just need the right varieties and the right actions at home in order to do it. Where were, these are, this is actually a terrace and those are chili peppers that we cultivate there. So you can grow them all uh, everywhere, but uh, our friends from Escuela del Verde will tell you more about it. How? Well, this is a small guide we have prepared. You can download it with the QR code and it will uh, guide you through cultivation, sowing, making your own compost, making your own pesticides and reproduce your own seeds. Thank you. Now, our president is going to show you through a small a short tutorial on how to get your own seeds from your own plants. Uh, so, thank you.
Uh, he's Pietro Segata, he's the president of our association. Today we'll see three different kinds of seats that we can do at home. One of them is wet seats that, it, that are still in their pulp. Another kind of seed that doesn't need any water in order to be harvested. And the third one, uh, there's no need for any technique. <laughs> we start with the tomato. Uh, we, will, uh, we, we start with the tom with tomatoes. So the most important thing is to get the tomatoes from the best plants. So we don't take only one, but a few from the best plants in order to produce those seeds, in order to avoid a genetic erosion. The fruit must be overripen, so you should get the ones that have been beyond mature. So these two tomatoes are the same variety, but the first one is still a bit green and is perfect to be eaten. The second one is, is perfect for seeds, so it shouldn't be eaten. Uh, we're going to use a technique that creates this mold you see on the on those seeds, and that is germicide. So you will get a tray, open your tomatoes, the, the most mature ones. And just uh, squeeze the pulp out of the fruit into the tray. Now you have the pulp, the vegetation water, and the seeds on the tray. Thank you. What you will do is allow it, leave it alone for a few days, three days, in order to that mold to be created. Uh, but don't, don't leave it too much because then they are going to no, germinate by themselves. Uh, no more than three days and away from direct sunlight. After three days, you just have to take your seeds, a strainer, and wash your seeds by pushing them kindly against the strainer to, to remove all of the vegetable remains. It's very important that your seeds are really clean. When your seeds are clean, it means free of any pulp or juices. After the, you remove the mold, the seeds come completely clean. Then you put them on a tray. And then you place them in a fresh place, but away from the direct sunlight for about 15 days. After two weeks, you will get just dry seeds. So seeds that you do at home are not completely white, like the ones you buy, 
because those are treated with chemicals in order to avoid phytopathologies. Uh, those are, are a bit furry when you touch them. After after 15 days, when you're sure your seats are dry, you put them inside a glass jar and you just keep them dry. Humidity is the worst enemy of seeds. If you put them in your fridge, they can last up to three years without losing much of their germination rates. Now we'll see other kinds of seeds that don't need any water. In this case, it's peppers. Peppers and chili peppers don't need to be watered after production. These are partic a particular pepper that comes from Latin America. It's called cubanele. You just cut the fruit and extract the seeds. Place them on a tray without adding any water, without washing them. The same procedure with uh, beans. After this, you just put them to dry in a fresh place without any sunlight for 15 days. Too. And the last seed you're going to see, you can do it yourself because those are cotton seeds. You can uh, find them inside the fruit. They can be extracted with their own, from their own flower. And they can be kept and in their own flower and then be sown the next year, the following year. You can see other kind of seeds that don't need any water and are a bit a bit rarer. That is amaranth. It's a pseudo cereal. Particularly resistant. And it is famous because it is immune to Roundup. The seeds stay attached into the plant, to the leaf, for a long time. So it is easy even for beginners. It is easy to get the seeds. So also with this one, once you harvest it, you just need to move it and then you'll get the seeds. They can be eaten and they can also be sown. This is a particular variety for dying. It's called Amaranto Red Opi. From the people, Opi people in the United States. We, they have sent a few varieties to us. That is a desert watermelon. It used in dry farming in, in our research. There is also an opi sunflower. It's also for dyeing. It's called opi black dye. Come 
Some flowers are also uh, as the cotton and as the amaranth. You just need to take them and then keep them, maintain them away from sunlight. The conservation depends on two things: how you keep them, how you conserve, preserve them, and of, of the skin of the seed. The amaranth is very small, so it lasts less time. Whereas the sunflower, uh, the seed is bigger, thicker. It can be kept even for up to 10 years without issues. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Pietro and Silvia. Um, before we start our next session, um, we are gonna have two quick uh, questions on the Slido. You can scan the QR code that is on that screen, or you can go directly to slido.com. And one question is, how much time are you willing to dedicate to your terrace garden? And the second one is, what challenges do you anticipate in creating a terrace garden? We are going to discuss uh, the answers at the end of this site event. And now our second presentation is a small space, big harvest, urban gardening in pots. Let me share uh, my screen with the presentation. And our speakers are Mrs. Gaia Sadra, director and founder of Escuela del Verde, and Francesco Cecchetti, landscape architecture of Escuela del Verde. Escuela del Verde has been collaborating with the Botanical Garden Museum of Rome and the Department of Bi Biology of La Sapienza University on educational projects about gardening in favor of biodiversity. So, Mrs. Gaia, uh, Mr. Francesco, uh, the floor is yours. So, wait two minutes more, please. <laughs> yeah. I meant to take this. I want, I want to remember one thing. Uh, you can you can go to Slido and also ask questions. And then we are going to discuss it. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting us. Um, our school was born a few years ago as, um, as um, an answer to a gathering that we organize every year uh, in April, beginning of April. Um, is it on? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> Uh, which is uh, called, um, it's a Green and Landscape Festival, and it's uh, dedicated to people, especially, I mean, we are, it's in Rome, so we talk about big cities, uh, which is, uh, you know, a, a big opportunity, but can become a big problem if we don't uh, um, take care of it properly. So uh, people asked us, uh, where can I learn how to do this or, or that? Where can I follow classes? And um, strangely enough, uh, there wasn't a place in Rome, so we decided to open it. And um, we cooperate with the um, Botanical Garden in Rome. And uh, today we're here to show you how to start 
um, vegetable garden in a pot, which is what um, we normally can do in a, in a big city. Just few of us can be lucky enough to have a, a, in a, even a small garden. Pots have um, their rules, but um, this doesn't stop us uh, to be able to harvest our own vegetables. Um, there are just a few things. The first thing maybe is that it's uh, it's a garden. In, uh, it gives vegetables, but it's a garden. So it's good for us, for pollinators, for uh, the, the, the whole planet. So every, every action is an important action. And uh, another thing is that gardening is a pleasure, not a stress. So garden as you live. Take, take your time. Don't ask too much to yourself. I can't, I'm not good enough. My eyes are not good enough to see the result of, uh, of uh, the, the questions. But time is always an important factor and um, you shouldn't be stressed or disappointed by the result of your gardening. It's often not your fault. It's, um, it, it can depend on many things. Also on simply on the, the plants you start with. But uh, we have Francesco here with us, which can um, uh, take us through the whole process of uh, where to start from. And while we go through the process, we can explain what's happening. So um, I am Francesco, Francesco Cecchetti. I'm a landscape, I'm, I'm a landscape architect and I work with the Scuola Ver del Verde as an, an, an educator. And, I like work with them because we we discover together that uh, education sometimes is more about relationship than actual notions, uh, and we find that gardens ha can enable people to create new relationship, new relations not only with culture and cultivation but also with other people. Uh, so please bear in mind this uh, that these. Uh, can be um, a point to enable you to, to maybe start your home garden, but then don't stop to what you see here. Don't, don't get may, maybe panicked or uh, for how I will water my plants when, I, when I'm away, but try to use your garden as a tool to know more people, also like Cercatori di Semi, uh, to, to get more knowledge and more uh, information and more... Uh, um, things to do with other people because your if you do a garden like this one is a very small garden but it can be a it's it is a part of a, a network an ecological network and maybe some small bird can come on your on your balcony or your terrace and it can change uh, the ecological networks in your neighborhood so um, we will start with a, a box this box is closed. It doesn't. It doesn't have any any hole. We chose to use this because sometimes uh, it's the only thing you have. Uh, maybe uh, for construction, for a from a construction site, or from from something else. And maybe you want to start a garden, and you don't have a a, a proper pot, a proper planter for 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 garden. For garden. <laughs> so uh, we start with the with the most difficult one so that you can be a bit less confused. If you have a, if you have a, a planter, a normal planter, the only thing that change maybe is to have like a trail to put under it so that you don't lose too much water. So uh, the first thing to do- uh, Sorry, Francesco. You could even make holes. You can also make holes, of course. Uh, so. One of the, mo the main problems with uh, container gardening, with gardening in general, is water, of course. There can be too little water and too much water. Uh, also, when we do our indoor plant uh, courses, uh, we know that the, maybe the majority of, of the problems with plants in our homes are too much water, too much humidity, uh, because uh, this plant is not very well. What what I'm going to do? I'm going to water it, and they they cannot escape 
this watering. So we are torturing them. Um, one solution is it's it's debatable. It's de it's debated. It's uh, it's one of the uh, thousands of techniques that you can use. Uh, a way that you can use is to put a, um, a substance that allow um, water to not be clogged, uh, plants to not be clogged with water and uh, to drain. So if you don't have holes, you can use something like that. Uh, this is perlite and it's, a, <coughs> sorry, it's a volcanic stone. And it's very, very, very light. It, um, it feels a bit like plastic, it is not. Uh, and it can host up to four times uh, it, it weighs in water. So we will start by putting perlite here, but this is not, an, it makes a lot of dust, sorry. So the weight is important also when we talk about balconies and terraces. Yes, yes, it's important because sometimes you have a balcony and uh, you risk to have, <laughs> to have <laughs> too much, too much weight on the on the structure. So uh, it's difficult not to. <laughs> so let's say this is enough. Okay. <laughs> so you. Generally speaking, um, soil doesn't move by itself. So if you put it like this, it will stay like this. You can put like a, a middle, um, like, how do you say that, uh, mulch, like some mulch here to have organic matter. This is a mineral, so it doesn't have any organic matter. You could cultivate potentially any plants in it by adding some fertilizer, organic matter, but it it's used, it's actually used, for example, for cuttings, for reproducing plants. It's just one of the many materials. You can use, for example, coconut fiber. It's a controversial, controversial material because it can have uh, social, um, it can produce social impacts on the population where coconut cork, uh, it's, it's worked, uh, but know that for the first, as a first thing, we will have a hygrophil uh, material here uh, on the, um, how do you say fondo? On the bottom, thank you. So after that, we will go with soil, which is, this is quite heavy. Either I help you or I Yes. Help no, help me. <laughs> Organic soil. Organic soil. So what is the most different soil like around the French house or close to where we live? What do so, you suggest? One of one of Thank the you. problems with our garden soil. There can be many problems with garden soils. For example, it can be polluted. It can be quite heavy. Uh, it can be poor in organic matter. I will talk as an experience. Uh, often um, gardens in our homes do not receive any organic matter for like 30 years. And then someone will come to me and say, oh, my plants are dying. Yes, uh, because it's true that <laughs> it's true that, um, for example, if I put a plant in a in a container in a planter, this plant will be uh, separated from her environment from soil. So, for example, water uh, will will end uh, more rapidly for evaporation, transpiration, and the plant will suck the the, the water for for nutrition. Uh, but uh, at the same time, if a plant is in soil, in, in, in a real garden, let's say, in a complete garden, plants can be educated to go look for, for water deeper and, and farther. We can do that in, um, in a container garden. At the same time, a garden can be uh, really, really um, 
poor, uh, can become really poor with, with the years. So if we start to, as we said before, talk with people that have gardens, that produce gardens and seeds and organic products and crops, and, and we start to use our garden as a, let's say, um, a poem, um, an artwork, and you start um, interacting with people who, who do that, you can start asking for questions. So maybe you just have, at the moment, uh, a container filled with soil. And this soil is used just to put plants. I don't know which plants I'm going to put. Maybe I don't know anyone. I don't know where to buy them. I don't have any, any network at the moment. So I will start with plants that um, maybe a small, uh, a small uh, agriculture uh, cultivate uh, near, near, near me. But this plant will be the start of, um, of a practice. So there are a lot of brassica here. And this is not about the plants. Uh, here where we are, it's autumn. In other parts of the world, it's not. So um, imagine that you're cultivating what, what you need and what you, can, what, what you can find in your area. Yeah, so follow the season and uh, be local as much as possible. Also because if they're locally grown and naturally grown, they have many more chances to uh, grow as you wish and you will harvest more and more happily. More, more and more happily. You can reproduce uh, plants and seeds, as it was shown before by Cercatori di Semi. Uh, so the idea is that maybe you can uh, just start planting the plants and, and then starting to, um, to ask yourself what I want to do with these plants. Uh, because, for example, uh, it's not really easy to um, to to give something to it every day for months from a small uh, terrace garden, but at the same time, if I start that process of um, of having uh, a relationship with a network of people, maybe I will do I will produce some salad. Another one will produce some tomatoes. Another one will produce. Uh, some cabbage and this can start a small act of resistance and and um, and revolution i would say so let's imagine that sorry is uh, now you're putting these uh, broccoli in which have a height and a dimension so what what should i think of when i choose uh, what to put in my pot so, you, for example, this container is quite uh, high. Um, let's say that for, let's not talk about food gardening. Let's talk about gardening in general. I have a terrace. I want to put a small tree on my terrace, uh, even if I, if I know it's a bit difficult for a plant to grow on a terrace because there is a lot of sun and everything. But let's say that if you have a 60 centimeter uh, deep container, most of the plants will have enough room and space uh, for, for their roots to develop. Um, of course, the more you plant, the more plants you, you, you use, the more varieties and species of plants you use, uh, the more you will be able to understand how much space they will get. There are some, there are some cabbages as you may know, that are much bigger than this container and become like this. Uh, so, for example, someone will want to plant, to try and plant a, a small fruit tree in their container uh, with some herbs or, or vegetables uh, around them. Uh, but please consider always that a small garden, it's a harsh environment for, for plants because you need to feed them with fertilizers, with compost, and, and the more you start to uh, questioning yourself about how, how do I do that? How do I resolve this problem? For example, I need to use fertilizer. I don't know how to do that. 
So I will look for people who know how to do that or sources, trusted sources uh, from maybe uh, from the uh, FAO website or uh, technicians that I know, um, educators in my area or uh, where available uh, field school also uh, and agriculture. So starting to plant these plants, I will know how much space they will need because it's not just the space in the planter, it's the space in your house, in your garden, of course, or your terrace. So the first thing to do for having a, a good and nice garden is to think, to sit a bit in your, in your garden and to, and to wonder how can you use that space to study, to observe the light in your, in your, in your terrace. Uh, because maybe you have to move your plants. Maybe there's just a spot uh, on on your terrace that gets a lot of sun. So another thing, when watering, it's uh, under the table. Yes. <laughs> Two useful things. Uh, when you're watering with these, be careful not to drop all the water all at once, because. As you see, soil is quite, um, it's very soft. So it, it, will, be, it will get moved. And uh, use water more than your fingers to press it, to not create like air bubbles and clogs and uneven uh, surface of the water. And you will see by putting water that probably you will have to add more soil to, to replenish because it, it will uh, uh, go down. Another thing that you can do is to use a sprinkler. And now this, it's closed, <laughs> of course. Oh. So a sprinkler, please buy one, use one also for your indoor plants, more than watering every day. It's imagine you're, you're a plant, you like humidity in the air, maybe sometimes more in the air than in the, in the soil. And you get a shower, you get you get water, you get uh, teardrops from from the sprinkler. It's better than getting like drowned in water every day. And another thing, um, this is a, a quite old technique called olla. So you you will have to use a um, a terracotta pot, and you see it has a hole in it, and with a cork. You can close it a bit. So why terracotta? Because terracotta can um, can transmit humidity into the soil. So let's see. Now it's not. I will just so you can see it, right? You won't see the the water inside the, the pot, but you will know there's some water. So if I put some water in it and then I close it just to prevent from stuff from, from going down I will have a source of humidity in the in my in my container so that that can maybe be an answer for the worry about I will be away while my home garden will stay in without anyone watering him. So, sorry. Uh, we haven't said anything about pests and diseases, but... Um, Do you want to say something? <laughs> but it's, it's always a worry. Pests and diseases are a worry. We don't want to tell you what to do in every situation because we can't, and every house has sometimes problems that are peculiar to, to a region or to a place. Uh, please... Um, don't just uh, listen to hearsay, but if you if you get into a network, into a relationship with people working and loving gardening, you will be able to find sources also on the FAO website uh, to to understand how much uh, some pests or diseases are present in your area and what are the possible uh, solution for that problem. And solution that can be 
ecologically friendly and um, mindful of, of, of our environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gaia and Francesco. That's fantastic presentation demonstration. And from the quiz you just built, like we can see, most of us, we would like to have our own home gardens, but we are afraid of being away for long. I think the demonstration will answer our questions. And so here, like I would like, given the limited time, like I would like to ask if anyone want to have the questions now, like we will have two questions here. And for the rest, please feel free to post your questions in Slido. We'll have our technical officers answer the questions for you. And also we'll invite Chakrati Semi and Skula Devada to answer the questions. So if you would like to have the questions now, please raise your hand and let us know. Please. Um, first of all, thank you for your presentation. I have a question for um, for the last team that just presented. And let's suppose we live in a very humid place, like uh, an island or uh, you know, uh, Venice, for example. Let's suppose this. How can we understand how much water our plants need? Because if the place is very humid, sometimes uh, it's difficult to understand if we need to water our plants every two days or every once a week, for example. Thank you. Well, you the, the, they probably get daily showers, so that's th something you don't have to worry about, and um, you surely don't have to water as much, of course, as a as a, a dry place. But this is a bit also because there's no rule, you know, because this is the typical question they. People want, uh, worry very much about watering. How how many times a week? It depends, unfortunately, <laughs> on the place and on the plant. So, but um, observing what you're growing, you you will see if they ask for something. As Francesco said, it's not necessarily water. In uh, in general, try to keep back from. Uh, too much watering because uh, j just have a look uh, if um, it's not said that what the plant is asking for is water but it, you see it immediately if you give a bit of water she you know flourishes she she pulls up its uh, leaves and uh, it responds immediately can i ask yes you should just see if the thank you the 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 soil should be moist but not completely wet, not completely dry. And you can see from the leaves, if, they, if the leaves are done like our plants here because they we brought them on Sunday for another uh, exposition. And right now they haven't been watered and you can see the leaves for example from that chili pepper, they're down because she needs water, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, the last question I, I saw. The lady has raised her hand for long, so perhaps we, I will leave the last question to her. Can you all hear me? Hi. Well, first of all, thank you for both of your presentations. It's It was very enlightening. And um, first, I would like to share my experience as an urban gardener. Uh, I've lived in a city which allowed me to uh, not to have my own garden at home, but I was um, uh, with a community of other students having my own garden. We were having our own garden and uh, taking care of it throughout the year. So um, to me, that experience was uh, uh, very uh, nice and uh, it was during lockdown. So it was also a way to come together and to learn about plants. We had some experienced members and we had some new members. 
So my question to you would be like, do you know if there is any uh, map or like way to map uh, within cities, urban gardens, in case someone does not have a terrace and would like to share this uh, with other people. Thank you. Yes, the, the, um, on the website of the Community Roma, there is a map of uh, um, vegetable gardens, gardens with run by communities that you can join. I would like to add also. I would like to add also that FAO has a community of practices in farming field schools, and also in uh, green cities. And there you can see also an exchange from people all over the world. So maybe we would like to invite you also to join those community of practices that you can find FAO. Thank you. Okay, we'll give the last last question, quick question to this gentleman. Uh, it's not to own a question, but I want to say something more to convince you to do that good practice. If you have a garden of a terrace in our real estate economy, European Union is the more cheap way that you have to develop the value of your estates. <laughs> Thank you so much for our speakers. Uh, in closing, please allow me to invite Mr. Heiko Kim, Technical Advisor of Plant Production and Protection Division, to give uh, the closing remarks. Dear Heiko, the floor is yours. Thank you. We are running behind out of time, so I'll be brief, but uh, I'll give you some practical also ways to follow up. So thank you very much for all the speakers' demonstration that we had. It's, uh, I think... Uh, as you can see, we have a hundred percent of satisfaction. I think not many people have answered, but <laughs> let's let's give uh, all our speakers and people who demonstrated a big round of applause. And as well as uh, all the ones who are behind, and I'll follow up on that. We represent the plant production and protection division of FAO. And here, I think many of my colleagues are here. You can raise raise the hand, your hand. So those are the people that normally you should be able to get some answers if you have any question on growing things on your garden or in bigger scale. So that's the work that we promote at the division. We are uh, different areas of plant production and protection. And uh, the deputy director general, uh, I already, I already promoting our direct deputy director to highest level, but yeah. our, the deputy director of the division uh, has opened uh, with kindly with this. I asked uh, the uh, colleagues from the secretary, the semi, whether some of the seeds could be available for you to take away. Only if you are in Rome or in Italy, you can't take it outside of the country for regulatory reason so you can always come i think same thing for scola di verde if there is possibility to pick up things uh, if uh, there is anything to some some soil or so there's <laughs> so that's that's my offer to you to to conclude uh, I'll, I'll give some last thoughts to uh, our deputy director he took the time to assist all this event in general there is busy schedule but uh, this is also appreciated Chike, i'll give you the the last words and don't hesitate to take uh, the picture or connect on slido our experts are available to answer any of the remaining questions that you could have or guide you to the relevant people who can answer your question thank you Chike. Last words. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Heku. I I share your sentiments uh, completely. Uh, but something that uh, occurred to me, I I, I was taking notes. Uh, I have learned to to listen to to the young people, and um, of everything that was discussed here, uh, the only thing we don't treat as a subject matter in the plant production and protection division is land tenure. Every other thing uh, the uh, seems like uh, a microcosm of our work. So I heard about um, the narrow genetic base of the, uh, of the crops on which we, we rely on for food. Actually, I think about six 
staple crops or nine account for uh, maybe 60% of all our dietary energy, um, uh, 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 dietary uh, calories. And um, yes, this is uh, one way to address it. But regarding the main components of the presentations and demonstrations, it's almost like uh, it is our division because you started with the seeds. The seeds, uh, we have um, the Seeds and Plant Genetic Resources Unit. Then you talked about the cultivation, the how. How do we grow these crops? We have uh, two teams that look at uh, the good agricultural practices, the, the agronomics, and then also the plant protection. So basically the three pillars of our division, what do you plant, how do you, how do you plant them, and how do you protect them? Uh, so we are not doing too badly after all. And uh, we talk about the one dynamic, the one dynamic NSP. And uh, a recurring theme that I heard about is the human network. So that we, the connections we build, uh, also constitute part of the ecosystem. So this has been, for me, a most enriching experience. And uh, I thank... Uh, all the all the experts who spoke with us, I commend you for your altruism, for the good work that you are doing, and then also uh, the young people for being such a wonderful audience. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So throughout the week, those who are interested to hear more, you can come anytime on the B Building seventh floor. There is a corridor around the office 740. That's the director's office. And you'll see many of the faces around here. So we're happy to connect and provide coffee. I heard that uh, it ran out before we started. So if you have a need of coffee to follow up throughout the week, please pass by. You will see some of these faces here and we'll be happy to uh, further interact with you. Thank you. Thank you all for participating. Now we reach to the end. Thank you very much for participation. Thank you. Wish you a good day and the beginning of your home gardens. Bye.